we'd like to begin our meeting. Um, I would just like to announce that um, council met in executive session this evening um, to be updated on the chief's corrective action plan and to review um, other personnel matters. Um, services committee. Services committee. I would like to call to order the services committee meeting and uh, call the fire marshal for his report for the month of February 2019 and the permit report for March of 2019. March Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> February was an extremely uh, busy, month, busy month for the three fire companies. Uh, most of them were all um, uh, very much weather related. We, we ran a total of 97 fire calls uh, in, in the, just that month alone, as well as um, we had uh, on the, uh, the 24th of February, we ran 22 calls just in one day, uh, all weather related, um, due to, if you remember, the ice storms and the high winds and everything like that. So uh, it was quite busy. Uh, out of those calls, uh, nothing, nothing major to report, no injuries or major um, uh, damage to any structures. Um, if you have had the chance, just take a look at the, uh, the, the opening page. There's some important dates uh, for some of the, uh, the upcoming uh, step-up events. Um, just to mention real quick that on the, the 6th of February, myself and De Detective Sergeant Egley and I, uh, we did an uh, a, uh, active shooter uh, response training for the uh, Wexford House. Um, the, the, uh, their uh, members and staff uh, were there, uh, as well as the uh, the first round of the firefighter physicals had taken place on the uh, Saturday, March the 30th, here at Town Hall. The second round is Tuesday, April 23rd, and that'll be uh, over at the, the Hampton Fire Department. Uh, and the companies had uh, recently just finished their uh, annual SCBA qualifications, and that was uh, that took place uh, two dates, March 26th and April 2nd. So we were keeping up with our training search for that. That's all I have for my report, unless anyone has any questions. All right, Marshall Stack, thank you for your report. Are You're there any welcome. questions from council? Hearing none, are there any questions from the audience? Good. Thank you. Services committee meeting is adjourned. And I will call to order the public works committee meeting. A report from Mark Sabina. Good evening. Um, I won't go over the activity report for March. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, if I don't know the answer now, I'll, I'll get it for you and get back to you. No questions from town council. Uh, review the bid tabulation for the town square culvert repair project. Memorandum from Gateway Engineers explains the specialty nature of the work which is specified. Something to say on that? Or I'm sorry? Do you have anything to say on that? Uh, I don't, no. Their, their report's pretty complete. All of them are report free? Mm -hmm. Any questions from council? Mark, have you ever heard of pen bid? Yes. Um, have you ever looked into that as something possibly that we could? I we were up at Alam and I, I heard a lot of really good things about it, and um, several of the um, contracting businesses were there and they were all on that. Mm -hmm. So I I was just wondering um, if maybe we could get maybe a little more participation if we looked into doing something like that. We've we've looked into it with uh, most of our construction projects and and. Anything that looked like they had um, companies that, that were on the pen bid, um, it changes frequently. Um, nothing that we've come up with so far, though, that we've gotten involved in has, we haven't been able to find anybody on there that could fill any of the uh, uh, positions or the, the jobs that we were looking to, to have done. Okay. But all we right. do look into it um, with all the contracts that we put out. Yeah, they said there's like 160,000 contracts. <clears throat> Or something mm -hmm. on there, something really big. A lot of them are not on this side of the state. I mean, it's it's scattered over the whole state. So it's you know you generally have contractors that are involved in all levels, electrical and plumbing and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's you need to find somebody on this side of the state to make it worthwhile. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Notification that approval by town council is required to purchase the 10 ton dump truck body central hydraulic system snowplow and hitch from Stevenson Equipment Inc. at the purchase price of $74,619 as per.
per CoStar's contract number 025-021. This equipment is for truck chassis approved by Town Council on November 26, 2018. Anything from Council? Presentation on alternatives for pedestrian bicycle travel and town property along Grubbs Road. I did have one question about the um, truck. How much was budgeted for that? How much was the truck? The truck that with the price of seventy-four thousand. Do you remember how much was budgeted? That was in our budget. Would you remember what was budgeted? Did we come in about I right think on it that. Was, I think the chassis was eighty-seven or eighty-nine thousand. The okay. um, the combination, the the chassis, the body, and hydraulics, and the plow, and and plow hitch, are all under the budgeted amount for the truck for the year. Okay. I thought they were. I just couldn't remember by how much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. We have with us tonight Mike Albright from Gateway Engineers along with Toby, Mark Sabine, and Dan Dice-Roth. Uh, Mike uh, and Mike, uh, they've reviewed this part of the sidewalk project and Mike's going to run through the a couple of options that they've came up with and, and talk about some of the costs. So Mike, at this point I'd like to turn it over to Mike Albright. Good evening. Um, as Bruce said, so uh, my name is Mike Albright, Gateway Engineers, and uh, this presentation is a follow-up to our feasibility memo that we sent in November um, for the construction of a pedestrian bike, bike pathway along Grubbs Road from McCandless Drive to Ingemar Road. Um, so uh, from this memo, we looked at two different options, one that is a pedestrian pathway only and an option that has a pedestrian and bike pathway. So right here is just an overall uh, study area, kind of let you know where you are. Um, North Park, right there along Lake Shore Drive. Here's just a little uh, zoomed in in the study area, um, showing along Grubbs Road. It's approximately 1,600 linear feet from the intersection there at McCandless Drive to uh, Ingomar Road. And uh, for this purpose, we just looked at two different areas. Um, enlargement A area is just right in front of Town Hall, and the other area there, Enlargement B, is by the uh, bridge along Grubbs Road. So we'll first look at here, Enlargement A. Um, so what we're looking at here, this is option one, and this is the uh, pedestrian sidewalk only. So on the left-hand side there, that's basically your top left, that's the um, plan view, existing conditions. Bottom left is just proposed conditions there with the option. And on the right-hand side is uh, just a perspective view if you're looking from the roadway there in the top right. That's the existing conditions. Bottom right is if it's uh, proposed conditions there. And we're just proposing here a um, three-foot wide lands landscape strip next to the road and then the four-foot wide uh, sidewalk next to that. So uh, some of the pros we see at this would be this would be the lowest cost option. Um, I think we estimated approximately $102,000 for this option here. Uh, it addresses the comprehensive plan and expanding the pedestrian network. Um, and then you also have that landscape strip that provides that buffer from the traffic. Uh, the con we do see with this is there's no uh, bicycle improvement with this option. And this is option two, which is the uh, shared use bike path option. Um, so you see there we have in blue that's showing the uh, four foot wide. Um, it's a road expansion, so basically um, you have to have I think 14 foot minimum there, so it would be a 10 foot uh, road road width with the four foot wide um, bike lane, and then there's a two foot wide landscape strip in between there, within the four foot wide sidewalk on the other side of there. And again, same thing, plan view on the left hand side and the perspective view on the right hand side. Um, so same here, pros, we see uh, expanding the pedestrian network, uh, which goes with the comp plan. Only this option does uh, create space for bicycles. Uh, the cons with this option, um, it does require the expansion of the road width, which does add cost to it, um, which we estimate to be 100, 130000 approximately for the, this option. Um, and there's also not really a buffer for the cyclists from the roadway. So next we'll look at the uh, enlargement B area by the uh, bridge along Grubbs Road. Uh, so same thing here, got the um, three foot wide landscape strip next to the roadway with the four foot wide sidewalk. And you can see it next down, next, next down there when it gets to the bridge um, along Grubbs Road. 
So with this, same thing, pros are it's the lowest cost option, um, still addresses the comp plan, uh, still have that landscape strip that provides the buffer from the traffic before you get to the bridge. Um, and it's also a nice little smooth transition, transition to the bridge with that uh, four-foot wide sidewalk. Um, but you do have about four foot there between the um, bollards and the edge of the bridge there. And the cons, uh, no bicycle improvements with this option again. And there's not really a significant buffer for the pedestrians on the bridge other than those uh, bollards. And again, option two here at the bridge. So same thing, four foot wide road exp uh, expansion, two foot wide landscape strip, and then the four foot wide sidewalk. Uh, pros for this, same thing, span and pedestrian network, but there is a space for bikes on this, uh, this option. Um, the cons we see would be the frequency of the bike use. There's not really a dedicated bike lane on either end, so it would just be along here on Grubbs Road. And then also just the shared space along the bridge. Um, if you had somebody walking along there, but then also riding the bike, you get a little conflict there in that four-foot space. So with that, questions? I had thought that we already agreed to having the to having Mark actually do this two years ago. <coughs> Why are we suddenly? We, we, this is the first year it's been in the budget, so it is a budgetary item this year. Okay, I thought so it was at least two years ago. Well, well, we've been talking about it for a couple of years. Yeah, but we didn't know what the, what the cost was going to be. And I did think we were talking about continuing the lane as an extension of that bridge so people didn't have to go out into the street. You're talking about bridge. widening the bridge? Well, it wasn't proposed as widening. It was proposed as almost like a, like a secondary man bridge on the outside of the bridge. I don't recall anything like that. Yeah, I recall some, some speaking to that effect. He took a peek at that. But I think Mike took a peek at that, but it was, it was pretty scary. He covered his eyes pretty quick. Yeah, the cost of it, it wasn't really feasible, I think, of having a separate bridge crossing there. Okay, so not, a, not just like a, a, a steel man bridge type thing. Just on the outside of the swinging bridge, maybe. No, <laughs> expected it to be stationary. <laughs> um, so we have the money. We have one hundred and two thousand dollars. We budgeted one hundred and five. One hundred and five. Okay, we have one hundred and five in the budget. So um, it's the season to move forward with this. What what are what are council's feelings about this? Um, th we are. Um, we have made a commitment as a town through the comprehensive plan and through this council to have, to add connectivity to our town as one of our prior priorities. So um, that takes that takes money, that takes effort. So we um, there's a nice sidewalk that we here have over here on um, McCandless uh, Drive, and to connect that sidewalk to sidewalk here that would take you almost completely to the park. Um, any developer that we would have come um, onto the Blazer property would be um, required, sounds so strong, but be required to connect up to that. Um, we're also looking at um, some uh, connectivity with uh, Hickory Hills to get people off that uh, hill up there, maybe through some stairs or switchback uh, trail. So if you look at that, you can go all the way from the Giant Eagle, right, all the way to the park. So that would really connect, um, do a lot for connectivity. That's almost like a whole corridor right there that we can do, and and this would be this would be our portion of it. And we can't keep telling people that they have to put sidewalks on if we don't put our own. In. It seems a little hypocritical. Yes, it does. Other council members, what what are your thoughts? No, we have two choices here, um, with the um, and the reason the hundred thirty thousand dollars is course so much higher is because of course it's wider and there's so much slope there that there's just a lot of earth that has to be put there to to add it um thoughts? 130 is for the bike trail then right? bike and sidewalk right. with a green buffer in between it that's what the 424 is and correct me if i get any of this no wrong, you're correct please. yep okay, and then so the it's one. four feet for a bike two feet of green right and then four feet of pedestrian so the only thing we essentially get for the twenty thousand or extra is the the two feet of green. The twenty eight thousand extra. You get that bike lane as well. The option one was just the pedestrian only. But it had a, but it had a three foot before the sidewalk. There was three feet that a bike could ride on. No, it was green. Yeah, it's so green it was space. green that way. Yeah. It was three foot of grass and four foot of sidewalk for option one hundred two thousand. I'd go with the full deal personally. 
So there's no possibility of having like a wooden, like, like boardwalk, by like built right next to the bridge. Connecting to the bridge. We could look into that, but probably not feasible. I mean, because I know down in Maryland, they have them all over along the highways, even in Delaware. I mean, right there, there's a boardwalk, which, you know, you can take a bike, you can walk, so. And it's not too, too super expensive, but, I mean, it's still costly. We can look into the cost for you if you want. Okay. And, and that doesn't mean we couldn't go forward with um, this and then yeah, add that this later. This and then add that at another time or look at that. Are your guys capable of building something like that, Mark? Currently, probably not. Um, we do have, for this year's paving program, we're still working on drainage. Um, it possibly later in the year, uh, we could look at it. I think under the the, uh, the plan the Gateway was working on, we were going to try to do all the fill areas that are, that are going to be required, because there's some extensive filling out across the front of the building that, that will have to be done in order to put the sidewalk on it. So there's, you know, if, if we were to hire a contractor to do all that to create all the fill areas that's going to increase the cost probably by another 20 or 30 thousand so say. that would be all we would actually do is just the fill right in this 130. Uh, how many people currently use McLean McCann's drive I, I see very few people <clears throat> using that sidewalk I don't because it's all sidewalks to nowhere I would yeah, hope that once time. we got it why don't we just wait till uh, we develop that blazer project that is supposed to include a uh, a personal care home? Wait to see how that comes out before we do something like this. Council, we're doing it now. Well, I, I mean, I think I think I think to tag along with that thought. Um, you know, the, the the flaw in this in this project right now is that it still leaves two missing links. Um, the link to to Hickory Hills, the link to the park. And uh, there are other missing links in the town that if we, much shorter distances that we could connect. I brought one of these up just a month ago in, in council meeting uh, to effectively, more effectively use the sidewalks that were installed along uh, Route 19 in the Wexford Flats. And so I, I just think that, uh, that while this has been discussed, it's, it's been discussed in terms of never doing a holistic evaluation of the this is the most effective project to, to lead with. Are, are you, well, Wexford Flat, Flats has some sidewalks, doesn't it? It does, but the entire Oak Ridge community up there is, is cut off because 100 feet of sidewalk was never installed when the project yeah. was done. Yeah, but so why, why don't we finish that off before we start? I, I, I think there may be other opportunities like that throughout our town that and we should be looking at. And less expensive. Yeah. 100 feet is definitely cheaper than 1,600 yeah. feet. But that, that's my well, <clears throat> while I'm disappointed that we've been talking about this for at least two years and now we're thinking about moving it, if we were going to do that, my expectation would be if we're getting 1,600 feet here, we need to be finding 1,600 feet throughout the town in other places, not just skip this one to do 100 feet by Oak Ridge. When you build 1,600 feet here, then you're going to need money to find a switchback trail up to the up to. No, to I understand that. To it, just like you did on 19, and once you get them there, there will be an outcry. How do we get to North Park without getting hit by a car? Mm -hmm. well, I understand road. We need to that. find money there. Well, why don't we finish Babcock uh, Boulevard? There's some sidewalks there, but the, and uh, do that as a backup. Well, that's miles. Babcock's a long way. Well, it's only a sidewalk. I mean, no, I wouldn't put it put it past where that uh, new uh, personal uh, not uh, LV housing is going uh, on uh, mm -hmm. Coomer. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past there. But there's already sidewalks. Some sidewalks. Well, that's right of Eminent Domain because on, on from there we that, that's private property, and Passman's supposed to be paying for the opposite side of the road. I think he said not put it there. Didn't you say not? He's saying up to the Regency, up to the, up to the, up to the Regency. Yeah, yeah I'm saying, I'm saying, put that the is Regency. there. That's on private property. So, I, in my opinion, I'm not really a big fan of right of eminent domain. In my opinion, we would have to have an agreement of everyone on that road to cut into their yard to do that. So I'm not saying we can't write a letter, but well, if Passivant's putting one on that side, I don't know why we would need one on the other side and go through all of that. Right, but that's Passivant's duty. Exactly. 
Right. Where, where is pastors right. on that thing? Is it, is it Whenever, Chris, do you know anything about that? When we ask the board, we'll it, it, it will. In. It will Passivant will be required to install a sidewalk on their side at the time that they do their next project, their next land development project. Uh, they've, they've been notified of that. I don't know if the, the, I don't know if the current uh, CEO knows that, but uh, some people at Passivant know that. We know it. We know it, and it's true. And uh, uh, we also have, a, as part of our comprehensive plan, we have a sidewalk plan the entire length of Babcock from for, uh, what's now Terrace Place, Vincentina Terrace Place, and the whole way to the other end of Vincentian. And there may be some uh, eminent, or there may be some right of way required, but generally speaking, there won't be. But there, that project's going to be, uh, we have estimated well over a million dollars for that project, oh. for the entire project. I know so, I but. Each piece has its place. Yeah. Well, I know when I took my government class of last year, you know, we rotated from town to town to town, and every town hall had sidewalks connecting to everything that was around. And I think by doing that here, we're connecting town hall to the community, and it's a welcoming way to come, you know, try to connect it to the park and over here once the development's done. That's why I'm in favor of it, just because we want people to come here, use the playgrounds, use the facility. And I just think it's about time that we do that. You know? And when people come for community day, you know, they're parking yeah. different places and they're they're walking here and you know it just to me, I, I agree with what Carolyn is saying that, you know, this is a good place to start. Um, the switchback trail that I was talking about with Hickory Hills wouldn't be what we would put in. It's not our property. It's their property, but we're in conversation with helping them because they would desire to connect their individual, their um, um, residents with, you know, um, a sidewalk that would be down on Blazer that would, you know, possibly, well, go very close, very close, a long way to going to the park. I have a question regarding that, that hillside that goes up to where the Apartments on Hickory Hills. What's the ownership of that property down to the, the road? Do you know? Part of that, the part that we were looking at is where that kind of cow trail is now, and that that's owned by Hickory Hills. Owned by I'm sorry. Hickory, Hickory Hills. Hills. Hickory Hills. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That that's if you had a switchback, that's in the general area where it would go. They would, they would have to look at that. Yeah. Their yeah, architect. Well, that's what we were looking at. Some way to get people off yeah. that hill down to the park and ride, down okay. to the, you know, down here so that they can go to the park. That's certainly a worthy objective to do that in some fashion. If the current destination is is truly the town town hall and the, and the field and the, and the recreation, then why not consider just a segment from Blazer Drive to the town hall, avoid that dangerous bridge crossing that we're looking at, and then take those other monies and do another segment in the town and connect additional neighborhoods to sidewalks. So instead of running at dead end all the way out to uh, Inglemore Road. So the sidewalk would dead end at the bridge? No, dead end, it, no it would end at the town hall where the recreation is, where the, the communities from, from Hickory Hills, from Casa Grande, from Berkeley, could come down and access the tennis courts, the ball fields, community day activities, those sorts of things. And they could also walk from Blazer Drive over there and unobstructed. My guess is more people are going to the park than they're coming to the town. But again, it doesn't connect to the park safely. But it goes a long way to connect into the park. We're 100 feet away from the North Allegheny football field up there and, and all those neighborhoods connecting to that too and they can't get there, they'll get killed walking on 19. So no, that's my feeling. A more dangerous area. I think it's a far more dangerous area. I think there's a lot of student foot traffic, much more than I've ever seen on Blazer Drive to date. And we certainly need to be looking at planning for that. I have no, no, no doubt at all about that. But that's not going to happen this year, anyhow, because we haven't even looked into it yet. This isn't the only sidewalk that we can ever put in McCandless. Just a suggestion. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, I do agree with you that it should be there, that's but all. we. So we need to, we need to decide if we're going to move forward on this or. If, if we're looking at something else, then we need to 
entire gateway to do some more engineering studies on um, some of these other areas. But we I would vote to move forward on it myself. And I'd probably vote for the 130 because 100 to 130 is no different, or not enough different to be concerned. Anyone else? We need to know whether to put this to um, to make a resolution to go forward with this or, or a vote on. Um, I need to know if it even needs to go to a vote for two weeks from now. I'll continue to consider it and uh, and maybe do a little further quick research on some other segments that, that possibly um, my suggestion of a compromise could be considered. I agree with that. I agree with that too. Second. I think that's a reasonable way to go, but then that just infers the opposite first the city. Well, but we can add, add these additional findings at our agenda review meeting, and then at that time we can make a decision whether we want to vote or if we need to table it or have further whatever. Is that what we are agree thinking about? Yes. yes. Very good. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. And that should be that. Is there any public comment on any of this? Hmm, surprise. Uh, I'll close the Public Works Committee meeting. Uh, I call to order the Public Safety Committee meeting. First is the Chief's report. Good evening. The police report is posted online. I'll go over a couple, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, Dan Stack and I attended the emergency management coordinator quarterly meeting uh, part of our training. Uh, I, I commend Dan. We work so well together as one of the deputies on the EMC team. And uh, he knows so many people in the, in the emergency response system. And together we we were doing some good things. We have some plans of some training this summer, emergency management training. Um, our department responded to a bank robbery, a key bank in Inglemar, uh, very fast, efficient response, an immediate response and rapid communication and the details left to the coordination of other departments and the individual was successfully apprehended. And uh, that's a pretty, pretty uh, isolated situation that that happens. I've been in law enforcement over 40 years that you apprehend uh, an individual that quickly. So I wrote letters to all the surrounding communities. It was a very good very good working relationship of how this happened and the individual is in custody we charged him and now he's going to be charged federally with uh, several other robberies in the western Pennsylvania area so it's always good to get somebody uh, off the street like that um, we continue I worked work very and we had a command staff meeting and we went over our expectations we have for the service of the patrol shifts very impressed with the command staff with their fresh ideas that we have we're always looking at looking outside of the box and good ways to continue to, to serve our good community. Uh, we've got a report from the North Allegheny uh, administration. We had a police partnership meeting and the feedback continues to be so positive on the school resource officer program. Uh, it was it was just, just great from uh, testimonies from administrators that are working in the buildings with these officers the rapport and respect that they have built with the students and, and that, that program is going very, very well. I want to talk a little bit about the Safe to Say program, which is a new program that was instituted, instituted by the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office and is a program that, 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 that the tips can be left anonymously and immediately investigated by use. And it's been very, very successful. We've had success, success with it already. We've been educating the students. They've been using it in a, in a good way. And the SROs in the schools and the police department, we were working in close correlation with them to make sure that all those, those tips are followed up. And it's been very, very good. Talk about our Bigs and Blue program a little bit. The Bigs and Blue is a mentoring program done by police officers to use in the elementary school. And uh, we actually hosted a lunch here at the police department uh, and it was it, it's just a great program a really really chance to give back and and have police officers seen in a different light and and, and be able to establish uh, a respect with them and it, it really is a it's an it's a good it's a good program um, I wanted to just close by saying first of all Bob I'd like to welcome you I look forward to working with you welcome to the town of McCandless 
and uh, Toby was here. Or, Toby, you're moving around. You, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you uh, for we've worked so well together, and I uh, wish you well in all your uh, in everything you do. And uh, it's been uh, it's, it's been good to work with you, and I appreciate it very much. And respectively, uh, Madam Chairman, that's my report. Thank you. Is there any any information on the injuries resulting in, from last Friday? Injuries from that woman who was. Uh, you're talking about Longhorn on Thursday. Uh, oh, was it on Thursday? You're talking about yeah. I, uh, there was an incident. Uh, she's doing okay. There has been an arrest made. I knew there was an arrest, situation. but I had never heard what happened with her. She's she's stable. Yeah, there were some injuries. Thanks for asking. Review the recommendation for the police and public works departments regarding a request to create a no parking zone for the entire length and on both sides of Valley View Road from its intersection with West Ingmar Road to its terminus. This will include discussion on the ability for emergency vehicles, trash, recycling, and public works vehicles to safely utilize the street. Do we have pictures on that, Bruce? I don't have to. I, you have to I, I did ask the chief to put some aerial shots in your pack that were additional to the ones that, that um, came. Yeah, because the other ones, I, I really couldn't tell what was going on there. Um, so it looks like that there's problems with emergency vehicles getting down there. Is that correct? Madam President, yeah. Uh, Mark Saban and I went and looked at it personally, and uh, it is a concern. Uh, we also have had complaints there, which I looked in a database. And the, one of the pictures that I furnished you with, you can see a van coming up, and you can look and see the vehicles parked there. And for new maneuverability, it is difficult. And especially, uh, that's basically not a cul-de-sac. It's more of a, uh, I would say, a hammerhead, small, small dead end there. And it would be hard for emergency vehicles to move in and out of there. Um, it looks like, too, that uh, for practicality that there are driveways available for everybody to park. Um, of course, we can make provisions uh, for special events and, and such. If there's a block party or something, we're willing to work 100 percent with uh, the citizens over there. But uh, Mark, I think, is gone. But our, our recommendation is that the signage be put there. I, I think that it's uh, also the uh, road department trucks, while salting and plowing, are having problems in getting hung up there while uh, getting in that particular street. So I would say that it's uh, it, the recommendation is, is a good one to, to post it. So are all the residents on the street, are they aware of what's going on? I know Lori is, but isn't anyone else? I don't know that, to be honest with you. Will we notify them, I guess? Right, we need to, to notify yeah. before we make any decisions. I know the people at the very bottom, actually, I, I think they have like seven kids, and, and I'm imagining, I know at least three are of, of driving, driving age. Um, <clears throat> so we at least need to notify before we make any decisions on that. I agree. Can we send a letter of notification that we're considering um, no parking on that street to the residents there? Bruce, would you do that? Are you the person in charge of that? I, the police department does that? Okay, I didn't know. I don't know much about this. Okay. If you'd like us to do that, we could do that. You want um, a letter to the fact that uh, it's under consideration or proposed. 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 Okay. Proposed due to the state your reasons. Okay. Um, would it be possible instead of no parking ever on either side of the street? Is it possible to have parking on one side side of the street or all? Because it looks like if you parked on one side of the street, that you still have room on the other. It still makes it pretty pretty uh, tough to pass through there. It's a pretty narrow street. allow parking on one side and if the other side doesn't get in people are parking in their yard the houses across the street that might tick off some people too um, well no. um, I've seen it done where you park on you're allowed to park on one side of the street um, certain days of the week and on the other side of the street other days of the week and then that way plowing can occur and that way it kind of evenly distributes it had a lot of that no yeah. point but I mean, that, that's another possibility but I definitely think we can notify the citizens and then so that they know they can come in and speak and mm -hmm. And then we can hear what they have to say and then make a decision. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so we'll get the letters out from the police department that this is under consideration. Okay, okay thank you. Um, we'll have comments at the end. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, so further discuss potential amendments to the town code regarding regulation of objects in the right of way, in particular signs posted within the right of way. So that's in everybody's packet. Was there? Um, did it have comments on that? Or? Uh, Madam President, uh, it, it it appears I, I served uh, as, as one of the subcommittee members to, to put this together, uh, and uh, at the recommendation of the council in our committee meeting. Uh, subcommittee members uh, approached uh, the, um, the Western Pennsylvania Realtors Association because of concern for, for business impact with this uh, this ordinance and uh, and based on their feedback uh, there has been amended language added to this uh, under due process and uh, and and, uh, and I'm certainly uh, comfortable with that, that that change on their behalf can you point that uh, under enforcement, uh, persons who violate this article shall be given two written warnings and reasonable opportunity not to exceed seven days to abate the violation prior to the town seeking the remedies and penalties set forth in this article and otherwise available under law. Um, um, and uh, goes on to say, in which case the town shall have the right to immediately abate the violation if they, if they fail to, uh, to honor those notices. So essentially the signs are seven days maximum. If a viol if the, the Realtors Association was very clear, uh, they would they would not object to to ordinances uh, specific to safety and clear lines of sight, which which this was right. crafted to support. They also were clear that unless this the sign or object is creates an imminent danger, uh, they respectfully request prior notice before the sign being removed. And this enforcement language provides for seven days prior notice before. Right it would be removed I if it's a violation. And as you point out, Mr. Kirk, that from the case is over of a dangerous situation that's determined probably by our police department, I would be removed immediately without notice. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council. Did the, did the Realtors Association regard this as a, as a practical problem for them? I'm thinking of real, realty signs. They're usually there for short duration are removed by the realtor at the end of the day and I see people uh, putting them up and then coming by and pulling them out of the ground right but when I posted about this online I had two realtors contact me and say we need that as it so that's our lifeline having signs up and that's why I brought it to council's attention well but this is this is not prohibiting putting signs up right not anymore it no. would have okay. the old one would have yeah, this one's good. This one reads good. So this would more, be all right for their open house. Right. right. Mm -hmm. okay. well, Madam President, just to a couple other changes to point out. Uh, want, yeah, I think you can come back to your seat. Thanks. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm just going to move it back from there and it comes up. I know, <laughs> I know, I know, but I feel bad. Thanks. Uh, a couple other changes. Uh, one, I believe you had pointed out. We added public to right of way, uh, just as a clarification, in uh, section 90702. And then we caught a uh, change needed in uh, 90703, uh, where we had uh, maybe removed forthwith. Uh, we changed that to cite essentially to the enforcement procedures that Mr. Kirk just outlined uh, that in 90704. Otherwise, uh, it's the same ordinance that was before council in March. So my question is that on the intersection and Peebles and McKnight, that big stretch of land there, um, that property is more than three feet back. Can there be signs in that? Also, on Old Coomer and Babcock, there's that little uh, triangle island. That's also deeper than um, six feet, be three feet from either side. So I couldn't find or didn't understand that any of us <coughs> would address those things. And do they? Both of the situations you're talking about, well, Peebles and McKnight is a completely state op state so if we are more or less deputized to address that issue uh, this ordinance since it's not there's no private property there it's entirely within the right of way we would be able to remove those signs the ones at Coomer and Babcock 
Uh, that's more uh, county and state, and we would not be able to remove those without without county permission. And we would be asking for county permission? We would be, yes. Okay. I, I, state, I know that we would be able to get the county. I'm not so sure about it. Uh, used to be that the county police would remove those. Uh, they don't do that so much anymore. Okay, so and it would be the same. There we have another situation, the exact same situation, in fact, at the intersection of Duncan, Ferguson, Thompson. Uh, we have that same situation. That one is loaded with signs regularly, even any time. Uh, someone takes some of those signs down. In fact, I got a call from uh, a church. Someone took, took the church signs down, and we don't know who did it. So, so would this take care of those signs? We would be as long as we had permission, yes. I think the islands aren't, aren't uh, are the ones that we would be able to take down, all the islands, with county and state permission. Okay. And we would just send a letter to them and ask for that? Yes. Okay. Just a question. With respect to that piece of land that you're talking about now, I think you alluded to this right as you addressed this topic. There are, there's just a proliferation of signs there depending upon what's, what, what the political season is. Is that okay from our perspective for them to do that? No, I believe we would be able to take the signs down in islands, according to the way that, or... That, that has not been done before, though, right? They just, I think for the most part, it's live and let live. And they, we right, have, that's why we're doing this. We have always left them. We have not... We have never touched any of the political signs since I've been here uh, during, unless they're on... Unless they're on, <laughs> unless they're on town property, we have not touched any signs. Right, Carolyn? <laughs> is there an intention to touch, those, to touch those signs now? That's what this right. says. That's, that's what I thought. So that's what a, this says. So that's a, there's a change coming then, right? Yeah. That's what this is. Okay. I mean, I found a sign today from a year ago. Right, and that's and that's what this is about. This right. is about so they can mow the grass and not have the wires everywhere when the signs fall down and and be in the storm sewers and those kinds of things. Yeah. But it doesn't prohibit anyone from putting a sign on their own property three feet from the car way. So I just want to be sure that everybody understands that. Any changes or anything that um, that needs to be made on this? So we can I feel comfortable with this one. Okay, everybody's good? Okay, so we'll put this on for, um, we'll of course go over it again at the gender review, but we'll put this on the, uh, for, the business meeting. Okay, any other questions? Um, now it's time for public comment. Hi, good evening. Marsha Kelly on Mohican Avenue. Welcome, Mr. Grimm. Thank, Thank you. you, Debbie. Um, I, I want to get back to the Valley View uh, issue. Um, would you? Uh, and I would, would want to consider parking on, on one side. Um, and if you're just now sending notice, is this something you intend on voting on in council meeting two, two weeks from now? Because I think if, if you haven't notified. No, I would say it'd be at least a month. Okay, okay that, that was my main concern is that people, you know, get like a week's notice to come to a meeting if, if, because they are directly affected. And I just wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to be voted on in, in two weeks. Um, so that's a great point. What do you think about, Chief, adding on to that letter that this will be discussed at the committee meeting in April? This is April. I mean, May. Okay, not that. In May. Yeah. Is that all right? Let me make sure everybody agrees with that. Okay. So that would be the second Monday in May. I, I think that would be really helpful the for the residents. The 13th, I hear. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then they know when to come. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and and to cons consider, I mean, our safety is, is number one, to consider really just only not allowing it on one side. I live on Mohican, top of Mohican from 19 to Hillcrest is parking on one side. There weren't fist bites when, when that's, those signs came up saying, you, I can't park on my side, but you can park on yours. It was something that was needed, by the way. But anyway, so I mean, if, if you can really look at that as opposed to really possibly tie the hands of the residents, I, but I would be concerned as to, and wanting to know what they thought. So thank you. Thank you. Madam President, I'll review the letter 
perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. This concludes the Public Safety Committee meeting. I call the order of the Zoning Committee meeting for April 8th, 2019. And the second item on the agenda is to review the public hearing on an ordinance amending Part 13, Planning and Zoning Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Town of McCannis. It would modify development standards and add a master plan regulations <coughs> in order to provide for greater flexibility in the use of use and land development of land in the C5 commercial residential district and to allow personal care homes as permitted use in C5 uh, residential, commercial residential district. The C5 district consists of the former Trader Horn and Bailey sites and vacant land to the north of Blazer Drive of, of approximately 15 acres. In order to adopt this amendment will be considered at the town's regular business meeting on Monday, April 22nd, 2019. Any comments from council? Talk about this? No. Yeah, uh, Bruce gave a, a real good presentation at the last meeting, and uh, I think he covered everything. And I, and there were, I don't think there were any public comments after that. Period. There were no comments that impacted the ordinance. Okay. Any questions from the other members of council? Any questions from the public? Okay. Review the pre preliminary and final approval of a subdivision lot consolidation application for Seats Inc. Care of uh, David Master Stefano for property located at 131 Montclair, 8500 Perry Highway, 8510 Perry Highway, 8518 Perry Highway, and 8600 Perry Highway. This is my uh, master artwork for today. <coughs> uh, I, thought, I thought we would do this uh, in color to help try to simplify it. When you just look at the subdivision plan, it's very complicated, so I think Hopefully this simplifies it. So what I've done is each, and you, uh, unfortunately you can't see the color distinctions, but this yellow piece is the C3 piece which faces on Montclair. This is Prazer's former office. This is the office building. This, this yellow piece is the, is the uh, pool, uh, pool business. This pink outline is the, I'm sorry, this pink piece is a comfort. So the subdivision, uh, and you can hardly see it, but the green area is the new lot one. The new lot two is outlined in pink. So it's consolidating, uh, it's subdividing and consolidating the lots. This was discussed at the Planning Commission meeting in the past by a vote of, uh, I believe, five to one. Um, so, uh, do you have any other questions for council? Any questions for the audience? Okay. Review. Review the preliminary and final land development application of Seats Inc of David Master Stefano for the plan titled Sheet Store Number 115 Rebuild, located on 131 Montclair Avenue, 8500 Perry Highway, 8510 Perry Highway, 8518 Perry Highway, requested to be consolidated under the preliminary and final subdivision lot consolidation plan submit submittal of Sheets Inc.
Yeah, I'm on your I think it looks I think it looks okay. Uh, we've reviewed this at the Planning Commission over a couple of a couple of months uh, and it was a tie vote. It was a three to three vote with one uh, one person who recused himself. So it's not recommended, nor is it not recommended, uh, if that makes any sense. But it was a three to three vote. So uh, as everybody knows, this is a Sheets uh, re re uh, redevelopment across the street from the existing Sheets. Uh, we went through a conditional use procedure on this, and the applicant will demonstrate that they are meeting the conditions of the conditional use. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Ryan Wotus, who is the attorney representing Sheets. Uh, Joe and Ryan, this is the, this will control it, the uh, yeah, mess it up. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Wotus. I'm an attorney with Goldberg, Kamen, and Garvin here on behalf of Sheets uh, Incorporated. Uh, as Mr. Betty had indicated, uh, the plan that's before you this evening is for preliminary and final land development approval. Uh, I'm sure as, as council will recall, in October of last year, uh, we presented a conditional use application uh, with respect to a portion of uh, the overall site that's to be developed, uh, mainly or the parcels that fronted along Perry Highway. Um, at that time, we went through uh, a pretty detailed uh, description of the overall development um, in addition to um, identifying that we satisfied the conditions uh, associated with the conditional use approval. So what, what you will see tonight um, uh, generally reflects what was previously presented. However, we still do want to go ahead through and show, um, show the, the updated site plan uh, as pr proposed at this point um, and walk through the land development application itself. And we will um, also talk about the traffic improvements, although those were discussed during the conditional use application. We, again, uh, wanted to highlight the uh, improvements that are going to be made along Perry Highway, um, uh, mainly with respect to uh, the existing intersection that is situated just to the north um, of the proposed site. <laughs> so with that, I think what, what would be easiest is first, let's go ahead through, um, show the updated site plan, and uh, we can go from there. So. Uh, if I could introduce uh, David Master Stefano at this point. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, my name is David Mastro Stefano. Um, I'm the in house engineering permit manager for Sheets Inc. Uh, the, the drawing uh, before you here is uh, the proposed site plan that was presented at the Planning Commission meeting um, not too long ago last week. Um, shows a 4772 square foot sheet store located at this position with five MPD fuel canopy facing uh, Perry Highway, uh, new uh, upgraded signalized intersection at this location with circulation around the fuel island canopies, full circulation around the store, uh, utilizing an existing uh, and modifying an existing entrance onto Montclair. Uh, we have parking on three sides of the facility as shown here with additional parking uh, to the south and uh, some three, uh, pars uh, three parking spaces uh, to the east. Uh, our underground storage tanks are located at this location. <coughs> we have a pole sign located out here fronting on uh, Perry Highway, uh, cross access uh, with uh, Mr. Rule's uh, business here, and this uh, entrance at the signal is a shared access between the Sheets parcel and the Rule parcel. Uh, we meet the requirements for the buffer zones on all, th all sides of the facility as well as the setbacks. Um, with respect to lighting, uh, we've uh, modified the lighting uh, from the original plans uh, from several, several months ago, uh, lowering the height of uh, several poles on the site to meet the conditional use uh, one of the conditional use rulings, and we are in compliance with the lighting ordinance. Uh, this is a graphical representation of the store. This elevation here would be uh, the elevation of the store that faces Perry Highway. Uh, these elevations were prepared by our in-house architects uh, representing uh, what the facility would look like as far as material and color. Uh, this facility will have uh, primarily brick, on all four sides with a band of stone wrapping the facility 360 
uh, three, all the way around the facility at the bottom. Uh, we have some outside seating with some decorative fencing and uh, light poles for sidewalk uh, accent and enhancement. Uh, this elevation here is the elevation that we'd be, be face, I'm sorry, and, and there's a public access entrance door here at this location on the front elevation. Uh, these windows here you can see in and out of and, and look into the store. Uh, this elevation is the elevation that will be facing Montclair. It also has a public entrance door at this location. The same brick and stone feature on this side. And here you can see on a profile uh, one of the outside tables uh, that is uh, situated here on a little patio area on the front of the facility. This bronze feature at the top is uh, roof screening for the uh, rooftop units. Uh, these last two elevations, this is the uh, elevation at the rear of the facility. Uh, there are no windows or anything because this is all basically back of house uh, of the uh, inside of the store. So it's the brick, the stone uh, feature with the bronze screening uh, for the rooftop units. And then this uh, elevation is the elevation that faces north or the rural property. Um, same brick and stone rooftop screening. Although this entrance here is a non-public, it's an emergency exit door from the facility. So uh, graphically uh, and material-wise, this is what the facility would look like at this location. What was that on the right? Was that propane? Uh, that, those are propane cages, right. yes. And then on this elevation, ice. which would have been the front, would be the ice chest. Correct. Uh, out out on uh, Perry Highway would be a pole sign which meets ordinance as far as height and square footage, so we'd be advertising two grades of fuel. However, we will be offering uh, also diesel fuel at this location. Is that going to be the price? I wish. <laughs> was maybe a year ago. Uh, this is a graphical representation of the fuel island canopy. We do meet the ordinance with respect to signage on the fuel island canopy. Uh, this is a, a diesel, uh, this is where we'll advertise the price of diesel. The two end pumps uh, of the uh, fuel island canopy uh, set up, these five pumps, two end pumps will offer diesel fuel. Um, one of the changes we made as part of the conditional use uh, ruling was we eliminated the backlight uh, awning canopy, and this is now just a red, uh, opaque uh, structure. Uh, ACM architectural uh, composite material. Uh, so we've eliminated due to the condition use ruling uh, the backlight canopy. Um, this is just a, a black and white representation with a little bit more detail of the site plan that shows the store, the fuel island canopy, uh, the current location of the dumpster in this uh, corner here uh, with the three parking spaces. There's currently a retaining wall that runs uh, the eastern uh, half of the facility. This wall does not exceed six feet. Uh, one of the questions that came up uh, at the Planning Commission was uh, relative to uh, the decorative fencing, uh, what that would look like, and there was a question concerning um, putting a board-on-board -board opaque fence uh, in this general location to screen any uh, headlights for if cars are parked in these three parking spaces. Joe, can you forward to those? So, let me get back up. So, this is a, a what the board on board fence would look like uh, if we go forward with uh, that those parking uh, in the guardrail. So, this is a good representation of what would be in front of those three parking spaces. And, and we usually use beige. It could be any color that the township uh, desires as long as it's available in, in that vinyl. But this is a vinyl board on board fence. And it would be uh, at that location five feet high. And that's not something that's actually required under the ordinance, but something that we're willing to do uh, to go ahead and limit any impacts on uh, budding properties. Is that right? That's correct. And this was what was brought up in the Planning Commission meeting uh, and some uh, comments from the neighbors. And next, uh, go back to the next. Uh, there, elevation. Would not, the, the there would not be any kind of plants or anything along there? Just uh, no, there would just be the fence. No, because uh, we, we drop off. There's a, that's a retaining wall. The, land, the landscaping would be uh, on the downhill side of that wall. Uh, this wall is actually the, the wall at our store in um, um, Franklin off of uh, the, uh, what is that exit? 
910 Wexford Bain exit. So this is at that sheet store on, on Nicholson Road. And this would be uh, the type of decorative fencing that was originally requested in earlier, real early meetings with the township that would be at the top of the remaining of the retaining wall. Just to clarify, David, the, although this wall looks taller than six feet, the wall that's proposed for the um, McCandless sheet store is limited to six feet. That is correct. But, but I wanted to show you uh, an actual picture which was requested at the Planning Commission meeting of what uh, the decorative fence would look like and this is what the fence would look like, which is very similar and references were made to the bank just up the road and their fence. Uh, this is very similar to the fencing that the bank is using also. It would be a, um, an aluminized uh, dark bronze or, or black uh, type fence. Go back to the site of pillings. Um, okay. Um, as as described in some earlier meetings, and as part of the uh, one of the conditional use uh, ruling requirements, is a uh, a mound graded that was at least six feet high. Uh, so going from the sidewalk along Montclair. Uh, this represents the mounding uh, against the residential to the south, uh, and from the Montclair side, the mounding is six feet or higher uh, along this section of the uh, roadway. And then uh, we need to transition down to the property line, so we transition down at three to one slope. Uh, and the slope on the, re on the Montclair side is also three to one, which was part of the conditional use. Uh, ruling and then on the sheet side we have a little knee wall and a two to one slope in order to maximize the height of the mound but also provide a bench at the top of the mound for plantings at the peak of that mound. David, if I may bring up while we're on the grade, Joe, if you'd go back. I wanted to point out, I guess this would be the time to point out that this area here shows grading off of the proposed sheets property line. Uh, we brought it up at the planning commission meeting that Mr. Rule, who owns this property, will have to put in writing that it's acceptable to grade off the property. Yes, um, we were, we're going to have not only this grading, but a portion of uh, the retaining wall that when this is re-subdivided, re consolidated, because uh, the property line runs down the common shared access road uh, driveway f for both parcels with the majority of this shared access driveway on Mr. Rule's property. So there will be paving, curbing, uh, grading, uh, and, and things of that nature. Mr. Rule is fully aware of, of these construction items and his discussions with the developer. And Mr. Rule is here also um, so he can, and can uh, answer any questions you might have. But he's in, he's in agreement to provide the necessary uh, temporary and permanent easements required for this work. <coughs> Uh, there was a question about, and no, I'll just go to the next. All right, um, this is the landscape plan. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in earlier meetings, even with the plan commission, but uh, we do meet the buffer requirements for uh, th this zone with respect to canopy trees, understory trees, and shrubs. Uh, we were also asked if uh, we could do a uh, swap out uh, arborvitae and not use arborvitae because uh, they're a type of plant that might be um, eaten by deer and, and other wildlife. Uh, so we swap those out with red cedar, red cedar evergreens. Um, and then we've also incorporated additional landscaping, especially along the Montclair uh, side of this berm. So we've added it beyond the requirements of the buffer zone, additional uh, uh, shrubs and uh, more evergreens for screening. Uh, to the south. And in, in terms of how the uh, evergreens were situated on there, one of the goals uh, was to create basically a, a linear uh, path of evergreens so that there would create year-round buffer. Is that right? That is correct. So uh, it might be hard to tell from this distance, but there's, a, there's evergreens uh, kind of meander. They're not on a straight line just because of the spacing of the different types of understory trees and other uh, types of plantings, but there's an evergreen that kind of s snakes its way back and forth 
uh, across this mound to provide at least one continuous type row of uh, evergreens f when viewed from different angles on Montclair. And, and one of the goals in terms of providing for additional uh, plantings mainly was to look for evergreens that have year-round uh, cover, is that right? That's correct. And this also, sorry, landscaping plan also, this was reviewed uh, in-house by our civil engineers, uh, landscape architect, is that right? That's correct, and as far as uh, the location of the plants and their spacing and everything was uh, designed by a landscape architect with GAI. And one of the conditions under the conditional use and also mm -hmm. under your underlying ordinance would require if, if a plant were to die, we'd have an obligation to go ahead and replace that. But we did take the additional step to verify that the, the proposed location, number of plantings, types, all would be compatible and, and should operate there and have sufficient room for growth. So in general, we're not only meeting the buffer requirements, but we're also exceeding the buffer requirements by providing additional landscaping around the site. Um, and that even includes additional landscaping out front along um, a Perry Highway with plantings inside uh, the biodetention area here and plantings accenting uh, the base of the pole sign. Keep, keep going, keep going. Uh, back up one. So um, before we get into some modifications we've made to design based on uh, comments we heard from the board and the neighbors at the Planning Commission meeting uh, was directly related to the dumpster. So I wanted to give you a picture of what the dumpster would look like. We've been talking about it, uh, but here's a picture of what it would look like. Uh, the, the brick is the same brick that we're going to use on the store and the bronze gates. Uh, this goes into where the, dumps, uh, the trash dumpster enclosure or uh, the dumpster containers are. And then this is the man way in our bronze gates, bronze matching the bronze on the store. So uh, with the architecture, uh, with the pole sign, with the fuel island canopy, um, and I didn't mention it when we had the fuel canopy up there, but there's a continuity of color and material stone, brick used throughout the different elements uh, of the project to bring continuity of color and materials, um, and it, it, it also transfers over to the dumpster enclosure. And, and David, that uh, dumpster enclosure is eight feet in height, is that right? Right. Uh, our typical dumpster enclosure is not eight feet high, but that was one of the requests and rulings. Of the, it was a condition. condition of the conditional use, so from slab level up, ours will be eight feet high to meet uh, that requirement. So uh, one of the questions uh, that was, uh, again, brought up uh, at the last meeting was relative to uh, why can't we just move the dumpster, move the dumpster away from a Montclair. Um, I had testified at the last meeting that we did look at the dumpster in this location, and we did look at the dumpster at this location. Both of those locations do not work because the grade significantly starts to drop off steeper and steeper and steeper as you go north uh, on this east side of the property. Uh, we would end up with a series of retaining walls uh, that would overlap into this where we have uh, sanitary, sanitary service laterals going down to a public, um, not a public, um, the uh, sanitary authorities easement because their sanitary line, this is an existing manhole, and their sanitary line runs down gradient this way, and there's an easement here. So we'd be overlapping this with retaining walls and going off the property with walls into this residential so the dumpster doesn't work in that location. Similarly, we would have to angle the dumpster in this location, and again, by the time we chase the grades with retaining walls, we end up taking out a lot of this buffer, existing buffer area, and we end up grading off property onto this residential. So the previous plans uh, had the dumpster uh, at these, basically these three, three parking spaces. In an effort to uh, do something to address the comment about can the dumpster be somewhere else, we moved the dumpster to where the three parking spaces were. So in this, in this uh, layout, um, should the board so uh, choose, and if... Um, by moving the dumpster to this location, we tie it into the retaining wall that's already behind the store. Uh, the dumpster's eight feet high, it's brick, so it also continue, it acts as a screening for lights for vehicles that are coming around the store in this clockwise position. It also provides screening uh, for headlights for vehicles coming in this direction 
whereas with the dumpster at this location, uh, we were relying on that board on board fence that was uh, to be proposed here. Um, we do lose one parking space, but we're still above uh, the requirement of 35. We'll have now 37 parking spaces. And what this also allowed us to do is to, uh, we raised this knee wall a little bit and we were able to gain another foot of elevation on this landscape berm. So um, that's a, an option that uh, we're proposing to address the comments by the board and the neighbors as to is there somewhere else that we can put the dumpster further away from the residences on the south side of Montclair. We'll note that, however, it is closer to the residential parcel to the east. Uh, this is the, the, the house as located on the survey. So it is closer to the eastern property line and that residential property, but that residential property has been vacated or been vacant for a, a, a long time. I don't know how long, uh, but again, this is uh, something that we're offering to uh, show an effort to address the comment from the neighbors and the board. Yeah, so two, basically two of the comments that mainly had come up, one was a question of moving it further from, from the Montclair uh, roadway. This was, in terms of looking at multiple options, this was the only location that's actually feasible to place it. Um, but as David had indicated, one, I, I think one of the important aspects of this is it now has a, a structure back there that will be larger than a board on board fence. Also aesthetically, it's going to be more attractive than a board on board fence and will create the same type of coverage that, that I think the community was looking for and at least members of the commission to go ahead and ensure that lights would be knocked down basically uh, to protect vehicles that would be uh, accessing that way. I think one other thing that I think was important that David had brought up was uh, based upon the other location, uh, the buffering or the mounding that was proposed on Montclair did comply with the condition that there be six foot mounting, three to one slope. Uh, in terms of moving this dumpster, uh, the wall that is now would be on the uh, sheets parking lot side of that could now be increased and what that would do is then provide for almost an average of seven feet of mounding. Um, so again, now we're increasing that by another foot over what was actually required under the condition. And additionally, uh, the landscaping that we had walked through would be positioned on top of that. And some of those plantings, I think the evergreens uh, were required to be, is it eight feet at planting? I believe so, yeah. Between six and eight feet, yeah. So at, at eight feet on top of a seven foot mound, and that is, that's day one plantings. So we think again, by, by moving that, providing an additional foot, again, is going toward really the, the aspect of what uh, council was looking for in proposing that condition or requiring that condition as part of this development to increase that buffering, increase that mounding, and again, minimize any impact uh, along Montclair. Also, in addition to moving the dumpster in that location, David, we could also fit the, some additional landscaping to the south um, of the dumpster enclosure, is that right? That's correct. So uh, where we had the three parking spaces here, and basically in this scenario, the foundation of the dumpster becomes the retaining wall. Um, so that opens up now this area here, which was uh, not as large as in our previous design, so we can outside of the buffer zone, we can add additional landscaping evergreens in this area to provide a, a more screening uh, to uh, the south. Um, these cross sections are three cross sections through that last plan we were just looking at. So the dumpster is now on the, on, on the east side of the site and uh, we've cut sections through here to show you know, relative to a passenger car and the average height of, uh, of an individual, I think we use five foot seven or five foot eight uh, for the average height of an individual, either on the lot or down on the sidewalk along Montclair. So these cross sections give you a graphical representation of the berm, the landscaping relative to uh, pedestrians out on Montclair, as well as relative to pedestrians and vehicles and the screening of the lights and the blocking of the lights by the mound and the landscaping. Can you just explain the variation? Because it, since there's three cross sections and it varies in, in basically depth and height, just to give, give council an understanding of where those snapshots are from. Yeah, Joe, Joe if you go back one. Okay, um, so the first cross section uh, is a little bit off this page, but it was right at the peak here where we're at a, a, a 50 elevation, a 1250 elevation. Um, and as we move down, Montclair, the, the grade drops off 
So we're coming up three to one, but also we're not falling as quickly on the sheet side. So in some of those elevations, it looks like um, Montclair is a little bit closer to the same elevation as the sheet slot. But as we go further down the next cross sections, about right here in this location, so Montclair is a little bit steep, a little bit b more below the parking lot, but still we got the three to one slope, at least six foot high mounding. And then the last elevation is further down uh, where Montclair falls off a little bit more and we still have at least, well now we've got seven feet because we added a foot to this mound. So that's why those different perspectives, you didn't have the same relative, you don't have the same relative elevation of Montclair to the Sheets parking lot because Montclair is falling off at a steeper rate than uh, the slope of the Sheets going in an easterly direction. But With again, all the, of these walls, where's the water headed? Where's the what? Where's all the water headed? All the water is headed to this inlet here and this inlet here. There's a high ridge. You can see this, uh, this is a proposed contour right here. So we actually have a high point about right here. So, all the, so water on this side is going to go down to this inlet in this corner. Water is going to drain out of the dumpster because you've got to slope it forward. And then water on this side is going to go to this inlet, which all goes to this manhole, which dumps into the underground detention system. And the existing site itself does not have any stormwater controls built into the existing improvements, is that right? That is correct. So, so the, the, the stormwater that currently would flow onto that site, which is sheet flow, uh, falling the topography, is that correct? Right. So anything, anything on the east side of the wall and anything on the east side of this curb right here would then go off to the east, but that's less than what goes off there today. Do you happen to have the size by any chance? The size? Of the pipe? Um... Uh, we got it on our plans. I, I think probably minimum 15 inch, Joe. That's 15. That first runs 15. First runs 15 inch. But obviously, when we get to the detention system, I think we got 48 inch diameter pipe and a substantial amount of that because we are meeting the stormwater management requirements for volume rate runoff. Uh, so we're going off at less than pre development runoff rates. Um, we will comply with the request for uh, the liner in both the biodetention area and around the underground detention system. So we will uh, comply with the uh, township engineer's letter relative to those items. Uh, so one of the other questions that came up in reference to the dumpster was uh, looking at the dumpster, looking down on the dumpster. Um, so uh, there's an opportunity uh, to put a basically a cover over the dumpster enclosure. Uh, it would not sit directly on top of the wall, but it would be elevated so you basically have a venting, a, a venting uh, zone, uh, but by putting a cover over top of the dumpster, um, you would minimize uh, the sun shining down on the dumpsters. It would act as a, as a visual barrier. Um, and water, rainwater would uh, be lessened uh, flowing in the dumpster because there were some comments by the neighbors about, you know, stuff flowing out of the dumpster and the smell of the dumpster and, and some other things. So uh, we, and should we show the picture, Joe? Um, okay, it's, it's kind of tough, but you can see here that it's uh, like a cantilevered uh, shed enclosure directly on top of the dumpster. So... Uh, we offer that as, uh, as an option uh, to address those concerns by the neighbors relative to the dumpster enclosure. And again, this isn't something that's required under the ordinance, but Sheets, in hearing the, co the comments that have been made, are proposing this as, as a way to alleviate those concerns. Is that right? That's correct. And this is a better picture with the lighting. And again, uh, the brick, uh, the bronze trim on top of the dumpster uh, correlating with the bronze trim uh, and the bronze on the store and around the site. And then the the cap or the cover uh, would also be bronze. And again, it's, you got this gap here for ventilation. So uh, we offer that as a, uh, to address and uh, those comments and concerns. Um, so the other uh, big concern that was brought up by the neighbors was uh, access off of uh, Montclair. Um, the existing uh, project, uh, the existing, the existing business there today. There is an existing entrance onto Montclair at this location. Uh, we are actually 
utilizing the same general location as that existing entrance onto Montclair, but we're actually moving it about 18 feet closer to Route 19, further away from the residential. And, and the existing access is full service, is that right? Meaning both in and out, left and right? That is correct. It's, uh, it's unrestricted, in, out, left and right. Uh, what we're proposing here, based on uh, comments we heard uh, at the last meeting, um, but us sheets uh, requiring uh, a full access at this location is this would be a mountable concrete curb island. We would have uh, it's you know directing traffic here by the configuration uh, to go right toward uh, Route 19. Uh, we have various signage because it was brought up uh, about signage, and we can work with the townships uh, on specific signage, but. We've got signage, you know, this is, you know, all traffic must turn right. Um, Where's the all traffic must turn right? What, what? This first sign as you exit the lot, so anyone coming toward this oh, okay. so is they all traffic. So they, they don't go down on clear. Okay. Correct. That's correct. So uh, customers uh, leaving the lot uh, would be directed by this initial sign that all, all traffic must turn right. Uh, the second sign they see is so that they know uh, they're going out to Route 19, so there'd be a sign that says 2 Route 19 or 2 Perry Highway. You can word it any way you want with an arrow. Directly across from uh, the entrance is a right turn only sign. So a lot of signage as well as uh, striping um, on, the, on the entrance itself, the curbing and the configuration of the curbing, the mounted curb, curb island, all directing traffic to go to the right, not be able to turn left. Um, uh, the representative of uh, the neighbors was telling us that you know no one's going to be turning left, neighbors aren't going to be turning left out of there. So we've configured this so all right turns go right. Um, another concern that was brought up was about uh, uh, kids and their bus stop being down here at the intersection of 19 and Montclair. Uh, what we offer uh, as an item to address that would be a traffic calming device uh, speed hump uh, just to the east of the entrance into the Amico. These two lines represent the entrance into the Amico, so we're just east of that. Um, this speed hump would have a walkway uh, to connect the sidewalk that we're required to put on our side of the property to a sidewalk that we're offering on the other side of Montclair. Take that down to a sidewalk pad, which could be the staging area for the kids until the bus comes uh, away from Route 19. Is our understanding that the kids congregate uh, in the parking lot of the Amico waiting for the bus. Uh, so we're actually providing a location for them uh, to stage waiting on the bus. We're even willing to work with the, the township and the neighbors on putting some kind of shelter there for the kids, well, if so respect, desired. With respect to the speed hump, uh, who, uh, who would have uh, liability if someone, a car hit that speed hump and then, uh, you know, did, did some damage to itself? Well, if we're permitted, and I might have to ask Mr. Getz to, uh, to, to jump in, but I mean, if the speed hump's permitted under whatever, uh, whatever our, our code requires, and I don't think we necessarily even though Montclair is a town road, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of exposure there, uh, you know, as long as it's properly marked, et cetera. We have some photographs and some other details on what that speed hump would look like, and then uh, Mr. Wooster, uh, our traffic consultant uh, expert, can uh, further expand on this. Yeah, you can go to the pictures. So there would be markings uh, to identify uh, the speed hump. Again, this particular speed hump would be designed so that it does have a walkway to get from one side of the sidewalk to the other. Just kind of go back one. So in, in general, that's, that's what it would look like and kind of for perspective. And then the next picture is one that shows one actually built. Um, so, you know, we can add you know, striping or whatever for the, the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And we still will be providing the, the required sidewalk on our portion of the property, is that right? Yes. So, Joe, go back to the, the entrance. The town would be maintaining that traffic calming device moving forward, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's a township road, so yes. 
and then we can add additional signage, you know, um, and we can, there's various things we do. We can, you know, this particular sign, we, we just offered up local traffic only, dead end. Um, a sign here that faces toward 19, so as you come up, uh, two sheets only with an arrow. So whereas before I was talking about basically people on the lot, directing them, saying you, just, you can only go right, go to 19. Anyone coming up will see uh, two sheets only, local traffic dead end, we can even offer up a sign, uh, pedestrian crossing, children crossing, uh, right here uh, before the speed hump, but in, outside of uh, the entrance to the Emico. So there's, you know, this is just one one scenario of signage in, in addition to uh, the configuration of this entrance to address the comments uh, by the board and the neighbors at the last meeting. Do you have any signage identifying the, the traffic calming device? Um, no, but we could, we, we, again, we could add a sign, you know, as you, as soon as you come off on Montclair, this says speed, speed hump ahead. I mean, there, there's, there's, uh, there's paintings right before the speed hump, which, uh, people will see. Uh, so, I mean, they'll, they'll naturally be thinking about slowing down because that's part of what these things do through these stripings and these markings is give you advance notice. Also, with a sign that speed hump ahead, so your your natural tendency would be to start to slow down, and then with the sign is saying sheets only left, they'll see the entrance turn and they'll be able to turn into sheets uh, right before the speed hump. So, again, you know we could have gone different directions with signage. There's additional signage we could add, but you know this just lets you know that you know we're willing to work with the township. We've we've heard the concerns of the board and the neighbors. And, and this is uh, something we can work with. David, if I may interject at this point. Uh, this, is a, this is a very recent addition to the plan, and I want to point out that this and the, uh, the dumpster are two recent additions to the plan. So the town experts have not had a chance to, to review this, so we're not prepared to comment on this. Uh, I appreciate Chief's willingness to address some of the issues that were raised at the Planning Commission meeting, but I just want to point out to everybody, we haven't even, this is the first time we've seen it, so. I have a question. So the speed hump, only because I'm trying to picture, like, if I, let's say I looked on the street, I think that'd be a nuisance to me to have to drive over it all the time, just because back your car, the noise. Um, so I was wondering if, could you not have a speed hump, but still have a concrete sidewalk that went across just because sure I, yep. I go through neighborhoods constantly right. in the back of my car it's just really annoying when I, I was have thinking to go over the same that, thing I'm like if this was my neighborhood oh, I would not right. want that speed home right. I wouldn't either yeah I think uh, this and I is, don't know what if you've had any input from them but I'm just that's my thought again you know this this was our attempt to address know, you know address some of those know. comments visual something more visual yeah. also to you know deal with uh, traffic coming up to this location and, and turning into the sheets and then it really doesn't affect people turning out. But again, uh, we have Mr. Wooster, uh, our traffic consultant that can uh, expand on not only uh, this item but also the operation of the site overall as well as the operation of uh, this entrance. But I think to your point, we would absolutely be open to if, if the town would prefer to not have that there mm -hmm. uh, and just have a crosswalk. Yeah, I'd prefer that, a painted pain crosswalk myself. Yeah, I think we'll, we were trying to provide options based upon, obviously, yeah. the comments we had heard. So, if, right. obviously, if, 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 ta if the town would prefer to not have that, then we're open to, to you know, your decision on that. I would just do a sidewalk, so that way it continues with the rest of it. Right, you or, or it, a painted crosswalk with sidewalk you know, inside. Paint comes off so much, you know, it's just another maintenance thing. Either way. Okay. Nope, that's it. Uh, good evening. My name is Chuck Worcester from David E. Worcester and Associates. So, uh, Chuck, did you, uh, you, you were uh, hired as the traffic consultant for this project, is that right? We were. And although I know you've gone, we've already done, uh, walked through basically the traffic improvements at the conditional use hearing, would you mind going ahead and just 
giving a quick overview in terms of what improvements are proposed as part of this overall development to uh, Perry Highway. Uh, primary improvements are the installation of. We're going back this okay, side. cool. There we go. There we are. It would be the the construction installation of a northbound uh, left turn lane on Perry Highway. Uh, in addition, uh, the southbound left turn lane, and then the incorporation of this existing driveway. There's a driveway in this location anyway but its inclusion into the existing traffic signal that's at the intersection um, uh, at Gloria. It, it is currently not signalized and, and we'd be bringing it into conformance with PennDOT criteria and including it into the traffic signal with the inclusion of the uh, northbound and southbound left turn lanes. And, and Chuck, is that something that's warranted now, but just because of this, the overall uh, proposed redevelopment, it's something that can actually be done um, as part of that improvement? That's correct. Uh, there, and there also were other curb cuts and access to Perry Highway from the site itself, is that right? There's another curb cut approximately in this location um, that we were requested during the initial meeting with the Department of Transportation and the town of McCandless uh, to close it. And so as part of that, that would be uh, actually decreasing the number of curb cuts along Perry Highway. That's correct. Can we also uh, talk about uh, the improvements or proposals for the Montclair uh, access? You can flip to that, Joe. Yeah. So David had gone through and talked about some of the updates to this, but um, <coughs> can you talk about just generally, again, quick overview of, of how the traffic is anticipated to flow then off of the site and onto the site from Montclair? Obviously, the, the, the traffic associated with the proposed sheets um, it's, it's predominant movement is going to be a left turn in and a right turn back out. Uh, we don't see any, uh, there would be no, no traffic destined to, to the neighborhood for any real reason unless they were patronizing, but they've indicated uh, uh, that they prefer that to not happen. Um, so the design of this island is to, is to encourage a, a right turn movement. Um, you'll see that this radius actually here has been, it's been decreased. It's not as convenient as this radius, so it's actually meant to somewhat discourage even, even a right turn in. Uh, they're, they're, they weren't uh, excited about that. Um, there was discussion of, by building a sidewalk, that, um, that school students destined to the, to, the, to the sidewalk, or to the, I'm sorry, the bus stop, uh, would be encouraged to walk on the sidewalk, which they, which they would typically do. Um, and that they would conflict with the traffic turning into and out of this driveway. Um, therefore, this crosswalk was, was uh, discussed and created, and then a new sidewalk on the south side of Montclair with a staging area uh, for them to not necessarily be in a, in a parking lot of a commercial business at the Amco transmission, but uh, in a, in a uh, place within the, uh, within the township right-of-way. Um, the, the speed table was just a consideration um, it's actually, um, as far as the speed hump, there's, there's two types of, uh, or there's a number of types of speed humps. In this case, this is not a parabolic shape of a hump. It's actually a flat ramp up and a flat ramp, you know, flat top. It's called a Gwinnett um, style uh, from a county, I believe, in Florida. Um, and so th this is actually an attractive uh, way to, to pronounce a crosswalk if you wanted to. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be there as a, as a speed hump. I don't know that we have a speeding issue necessarily on Montclair, simply to, uh, to give it a visual as well as, uh, as, as a, a traffic calming device. Um, so that's, that's how that was, that was uh, uh, originally proposed. But again, somewhat optional. <clears throat> In talking about the uh, Montclair access, we walked through this uh, before the Planning Commission as well, but there are four criteria associated with additional access in the RC district. Sure. Um, this is under section uh, 1328.10. Uh, first criteria is that this lot is a corner lot. Uh, I think we can agree that this is a corner lot. This so is indeed a corner lot. That one's the easy. Uh, there shall be no loading or offloading from a residential street. From your understanding of the operation of this facility, there won't be loading or unloading from Montclair, is that right? That's correct. The third is uh, it's determined that such access will not substantially alter the character of the residential area. 
Uh, now, this proposed access is situated wholly within the RC district, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, I believe that the line is approximately here, where this would be residential and this is RC. This is all RC. And are you aware of what use is uh, located to the south of the facility? That is a commercial use. It's a AMCO transmission facility. And they also similarly have access off of Montclair in, in that general vicinity, is that correct? They actually have two access points uh, on Montclair, one approximately here. There's another one actually down here. Um, and then they have access to 19 at two locations. And as discussed, the <coughs> existing site itself currently maintains full access or unrestricted access off of Montclair to, uh, to the subject property, is that right? It does. And, and that traffic or access actually um, is able to go around the building and, and front again or to enter back onto Perry Highway as well? That's correct. And based upon where the proposed location of this um, access point would be, it, again, is situated further to the west or closer to Perry Highway. Is that right? That's correct. So it's actually uh, decreasing uh, basically the nonconformity of the existing location of that full access onto the site. That's correct. <clears throat> and the last is uh, that it would not contribute to a safety hazard. So from a, let's talk generally about commercial uses that are on, on corner lots and, and how those are generally constructed for access and circulation um, from a traffic perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the primary uh, improvement safety for this whole area is going to be the construction of the, of the, the turn lanes and the inclusion of this particular driveway, uh, the main driveway, into the traffic signal. Um, that's a significant safety improvement for the for the area, including Montclair. Um, and this driveway is used uh, it for adequate circulation of a, of a commercial site, uh, much like you have it today, much like as it's over at this commercial site. Uh, you have access to the side street as well as the front. This allows for uh, improved um, uh, emergency management um, uh, circulation through the site in the event of any any issues at this intersection or this intersection you can have continu uh, continuity of, uh, of service through to Montclair uh, through the site even though this is a um, an island meant to uh, encourage traffic it's also mountable and could be could be breached by emergency vehicles if necessary so I guess to that point to the extent that access were pro prohibited for any reason from Perry Highway directly to the site this would give the alternative access for uh, first responders or other safety vehicles it would indeed and are you aware that there's uh, the fire hydrants actually situated there on the corner of Perry Highway and Montclair yes is there a stop sign on that right turn Coming on this yeah, that's, that's uh, I'd say that somewhat of a redundant sign. Uh, vehicle code requires you to stop at all driveways when entering right. into the right of way. But yes, there'll be a stop sign on that on that access. It's not free flow. It's meant to simply give direction. Right. Not yeah. No, there'll be a stop sign. I want to make sure. No, nope, absolutely. And another thing I want to talk about is generally when you, again, going back to commercial facilities on corners and people anticipating that they would have two points of access, one off of of the, the frontage and also the additional side access. In a situation such as this, if that access were not provided, uh, it, that potentially could create an issue with vehicles not being able to enter onto the sheet site with the expectation that they could. Is that right? Yes. Uh, uh, facilities like, like the sheets, uh, other convenience stores, other commercial uh, properties developed onto a corner, it's quite intuitive and, and, and very common that they have access to the side street. So intuitively, a driver seeing signs if they're northbound are going to assume that this this will provide access to this corner lot so we fully anticipate that if there if there was no access you'll still get people using it looking for that access well uh say they were uh, coming down montclair and there's no you know turn into a gas station couldn't they use the Am amco uh, uh driveway to turn around oh. I'm, I'm sure they could, they could turn around anywhere along that that roadway. So whether they turn around in, into here and, and zip around somewhere, there there are certain properties. They'll they'll enter a private property and they'll have to turn around. There's no you know obviously this is a dead end. There's no cul-de-sac or anything turn around. They'll have to turn around on a piece of private property. But I'm just saying that intuitively, I've been in this business for a long time. There's I've never done a a 
a site on a corner that didn't have access to the side street, drivers are going to intuitively think that that's where a an access is. So I fully expect people to use Montclair anticipating an access there <clears throat> until they learn that, that one might not be there. But um, I, I would not promote not having this access. And Chuck, based upon the proposed signage and the um, right turn only from the site back to, to Perry Highway, you believe that that would appropriately mitigate any issues associated with that access, is that right? Yes. So looking at this from like a sound, sound traffic planning principles, um, you believe that, that this, this type of facility should have dual access, meaning from Montclair and from Perry Highway? Yes, I do. Any other questions have, from a traffic perspective? A couple questions. The one reason I had asked about the stop sign was because if I lived in Montclair, whether I thought I was going to use the store or not, instead of having a right turn only sign, I would want that stop sign, but I would also want to say maybe exit sign aim to the right mm -hmm. instead of the right turn only. Because if they do decide that they want to go to the sheets and want to do, do want to turn left, you know, they should be able to do that without fear of being ticketed. So I, I, you're you're talking about if they exit here, that right. they should be able to turn left. Well, I'm saying that we should still aim a sign to I, the right as an exit sign, but allow instead of saying right turn only, and we can talk to them about right. it later. But uh, you know, that would be. I I well, agree. I, I I agree from a traffic engineering standpoint and from a practical standpoint, that it should be full access. This attempt is to attempt to appease the residents. Of, right, and of I, I totally get so, putting the sign to the right. I totally get curbing the it could, roads. It, so could it, certainly like be, it could certainly be done that way, To, We're not anticipating, if, if this was a through street and you know showed up on GPS that right. it was a through street, I would agree that, that there's a concern, but it's a dead end. Right. It's shown as a dead end on everyone's GPS. People that are that have come from 19 that are anticipating using this facility, uh, that have used Montclair, well, if they're continuing northbound, they're going to come in this way. They're going to go out the, right. the, the main access. But as a convenience um, and, and you know, for circulation and, and things like that, I, I think it should be uh, primarily because th this allows option to get to a traffic signal that we're enhancing and, and including into the intersection for safety reasons. So it would, it would afford them opportunity to utilize that signal. I agree with you. She says uh, pr uh, proposed Montclair entrance seems to be a real concern for the Montclair residents. It seems to be a concern for some of the members of the planning commission. Mm -hmm. There is that there is currently a driveway at, into 8510 from Perry Highway. The middle uh, Perry Highway property in the Sheets Project, 8510 is where about the, uh, right? Up where about is that driveway? The, the existing driveway up for Perry? Yeah. Here, we can go back. I think it's the existing condition. Yeah, right the there. existing. The existing survey. There you are. Right it's here? Right there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and where's the, uh, where's the, uh, driveway. signalized uh, entrance. It's well, not, it's, there's an entrance here, well, but it's well, not well, signalized. Yeah, but well, here well, it is right well, here. Well, 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 well. Right here. Okay. And so it's, it's a, I, I was driving past here. It looks like it's approximately 50 feet or so. Um, and I, I believe the, uh, the planning commission chairman, Mr. Uh, Miner, asked if a second driveway on Perry, Perry Highway could replace Montclair. And, and you, I believe, Mr. Wooster, you said that uh, PennDOT denied a second driveway of Perry Highway due to the proxi proximity of a, of a signalized driveway. It seems like the driveway into 8510, which is approximately 15 feet, uh, will be the one that is sig the uh, signalized one is the one that's far to the uh, north. Uh, I looked at the BP station on Perry Highway and Swickley Oakmont Road and Three Degree Road. Are you familiar with those? I'm not. Okay, it's they're about a mile south of uh, mm -hmm. on Perry Highway, and there are two driveways into that station and one at the light on Perry Highway. There's two driveways and one signalized station, uh, signalized 
uh, entrance on Perry Highway across from the Swickley Oakmont Road. One of the driveways on Perry Highway seems to be only a few feet from the signalized entrance at Swickley Oakmont, Oakmont and Perry Highway. There is also an entrance on Three Degree Road, which sort of would be mo like Montclair, mm -hmm. but except that that has a lot of traffic coming up from it since it's a true collector road. Mm -hmm. And also going north, are you familiar with the station going north on Perry Highway? It's, it's approximately a mile from your, your current station. I'm not not familiar with it, if, but You're I've seen lots of, lots of yeah, gas stations. Yeah, Cumberland, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it's uh, at the uh, intersection of Cumberland and Perry Highway. The station has two driveways from Perry Highway into that gas station. It has also a driveway from C Cumberland, another collector road. So if there's people coming up uh, Cumberland, on, on going uh, west on Cumberland, they can easily pull into that, uh, but, but uh, that driveway, the couple went on, uh, into off of Cumberland. But they're they're collector roads. They're, they're they're roads that have traffic coming up, and they're not dead end streets. You make a very good point there. Well, Greg. let me let me finish my point. I can't understand why uh, PennDOT would uh, disallow a second driveway off Perry Highway unless she could exclude Montclair. Uh, I, I realize that. In the, in the PC draft minutes for the last Tuesday's meeting, uh, you said the second access is re requested for circulation to provide mm -hmm. two means of ingress and egress for emergency vehicles and for the convenience of employee customers. Yet the fire marshal, I th believe he's still here, uh, yes. said uh, states that fire trucks will enter and exit Perry Highway. Uh, I'm just confused as to why you have to use Montclair. You could use Perry Highway and have two, uh, two uh, entrances into right. uh, Perry Highway. I, I, I explained. Yep. And a uh, record. Re right. I explained it. We went to the Department of Transportation. That meeting was attended um, by town McCandless. The Department of Transportation um, said if you're going to signalize that access, you'll close the other ones. Um, there is also a significant grade difference in the front here uh, into the site plan for the sheet. So it would almost be impossible to do, as you notice in the, in the site plan for the sheets, that's where they, the, uh, there's, there's things well, there that get in the way. Well, the but the Department of Transportation, we discussed this with the Department of Transportation on the road that they own about yeah. having also a, a die van or access here, and they said no. Well, the, the, drive, the, the driveway's in here, right? They asked us to close that. So they asked and it's you, also, I believe, they consistent. Or something as they, why they the, have it? There's, they, there's one within a few feet. Right. There's a, the there's a lot of driveways, much like this one, that they're not excited about having. They predate a lot of their criteria. They've and asked us to utilize this one and close the other. So, so they have regulations uh, on their books uh, that would require this? Yes. Could we get, get? Could you give them to? Uh, sure, you have them, and your consultant has them. Do you have them? Uh, right. Mr. Getz might have. Yeah. The, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we we have them. I I just add the the two cases. Uh, Robert Getz, Trans Associates. The two cases that you mentioned, the uh, the BP and Ross and the Snoco. I mean, those stations are very very old properties mm -hmm. and. That's not necessarily the, the rule of the day with PennDOT is all about ma access management. So uh, we reviewed the, the traffic study. We reviewed the site three times, reviewing the signals, the improvements here. And I think this is the best plan we can get. <laughs> I really do. I think it's a safe plan because they're coming out at a signalized intersection on 19. Uh, if you look at the traffic study and the way that the volumes were routed in and out of here, only about 10 percent of the traffic from the site is projected to use Montclair Avenue. About 90% is projected to use the traffic signal. And that makes perfect sense because for four to six hours a day, if you come out Montclair and you attempt to make a left on Perry Highway, you're probably going to be waiting a long time. So it just makes sense to come out at the signal. It's safer. You won't have to wait as long. There's going to be a new signal put in there. There's going to be turn lanes. And again, it's going to be a lot safer. So the, the traffic pattern, as far as we're concerned, Trans Associates concerned, we reviewed it. it, it makes a lot of sense. Just so I understand, I have a quick question. Um, 
So they're asking that you close it, but they're not saying you have to, like it's mandatory. We have to. Okay, so, but, because I was just thinking of the gas station, the get-go on McKnight Road, because they have two entrances right there on McKnight. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's, that's a little different situation. They don't have direct access to the signal at Browns Lane. Yeah. They have indirect access, so they have a driveway on Browns Lane, and they have right in, right out on McKnight, but McKnight also has a median in it, therefore, it is just that, a right in, right out. Whereas this will be full access, right out of signal. Uh, going, going back to your point, Greg, that these other places that did have all the access on the other road, in my head, and I might be wrong on this, but I'm counting nine gas stations from Pittsburgh to the sheets out in Cran or actually, no, nine gas stations from Pittsburgh to the uh, Warrendale 7-Eleven. And every single one of them has an access point to the to the, to both roads, well, which, like well, he was saying, intuitively, with nine in a row already having that, if we don't put it where they want to put it, they're still going to end up with traffic with well, cars. Are any of those roads? Uh, are all those roads collector roads, or are, are any of those roads dead end? There might be one. The second one passed the horseshoe bend on 19 that might be a dead end i don't know the other ones definitely are not but i'm but like he was saying the intuitiveness of a of a driver if we did what you want to do i don't know how many but i wouldn't be surprised at all if there weren't 50 or 100 cars a day pulling in to montclair anyhow and then going oh geez where do i go now well, you could have signage that it says not an entrance for, for the uh, gas station. on Montclair? Yeah. And you're expecting that many people to pay that much attention? I mean, I, I can tell you. It would be only people going north. I don't. I can't see uh, people going south. You're correct. It would probably only be people going north that would be turning into Montclair accidentally. But they would certainly be doing it. I can't imagine them not doing it. I mean, I see signs all the time that people ignore, so they're certainly going to ignore that. Is anyone else, uh, anyone else in council have comments? We have a couple, we have a couple other okay. items. Not to prolong yeah, things, but this one's right. required. <laughs> One of the other items um, uh, that we were asked to provide um, as part of the traffic study, one of the requirements of the Department of Transportation is for us to uh, receive what's called a marginal level of service waiver. Um, we need a marginal level of service waiver for a number of, uh, for a couple of reasons. The primary one is during the morning and Saturday peak street traffic hours, um, we'll have uh, a slightly greater delay that these turn lanes don't necessarily mitigate. It has, it has a lot to do with the way we were asked to calculate trip generation, but it also has to do with, I'll say, the starting position of our level of service. So as, as you've heard me say, and I'm sure other traffic consultants say, we, we measure everything in almost a report card grade in operational characteristics of an intersection A through F. The interesting part of the intersection is during the morning peak street traffic hour and a Saturday peak hour, you're at essentially a C minus already. In the case of the morning peak hour, it's a C minus minus. So you add anything to it and it, and, and it degrades to the point where you really can't fix it, even the turn lanes. What we did is to, to, to really bring highlight to that, the we simply took the, the traffic conditions that we measured prior to any development. Um, that would be that the sheet's still over in this corner and this driveway, and all we did was signalize this driveway. Now, it, I think I've explained before, by signalizing this driveway, we have to add a phase to the traffic signal. With the turn lanes and this access, they have to come out by themselves. They would normally come out with Gloria, but the grade of Gloria being that dip you can't see coming out of Gloria, and so we have to what we call split the side street. So they would come out by themselves. Anytime you add a phase to a traffic signal, you're introducing a little bit of inefficiency because you have to create a yellow and an all red and then change phases. That phase change introduces uh, a time where traffic's not moving. 
it is certainly necessary from a safety standpoint. But what we did to demonstrate this, how bad the, the it's not how bad the level of service is, but how low the C is, if we assumed no development at all, simply signalize this access, put in the left turn lanes, but signalize the access, you still need a marginal level of service uh, waiver because it would degrade from, it degrades from the low C to a very high D. So um, it's more of a, I'll call it a math issue. Uh, we've written the letter. Um, I, I know that your consultant has seen it. Uh, and in fact, uh, originally uh, during the, the, the development and his review has recommended that the, that the township uh, support the marginal level of service waiver. It is a, more of a, um, a, a formality with the Department of Transportation. It's just that they recognize that you're not, you're not uh, because we're adding that phase and because we're adding the left turn phases on the road, um, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> That's essentially what it, what it signs up for. So. so I guess, Chuck, just, just to uh, yeah, I guess talk about that a little bit more, right. though, is regardless of any improvements, just by fixing an existing deficiency that's there, that being the, the un, uh, unsignalized access from Todd Rule's property. Yes. Just by fixing that existing safety issue or hazard, right. that in and of itself creates the request for the level service. Exactly. If you had your million plus dollars to do what we're doing here and somebody just came and did it and said we want to do this, the department would require a, a marginal level of service waiver requirement from you even though you were volunteering to do this with zero development at all. So it would still require one. And it's it's primarily because you're adding that phase. So we've, we've prepared a, uh, uh, a, a marginal level of service wa waiver request for uh, the township for your consideration. Any questions regarding that? That means just the light is delayed. So that's just, it backs up traffic a little bit, right? Um, it, it, it would almost be imperceptible to the average driver. What we're doing is we're adding a, a significant improvement in safety uh, for this access and for the left turn lanes, but you're, you're, you're not gonna get the full benefit um, if it was to come out with Gloria if you were to fill in Gloria so that it's not a big dip or if you're to make Gloria one way away you can make the marginal level of service waiver request go away but that's not going to happen either so it, it is uh, more of a formality from an operation standpoint All right. thank you any uh, other questions from uh, town council we have a couple other items that we have to have to address and one of them is that it would be, uh, we're, we're asking sheets to, there's a, not, a lot of signage which is proposed here, and uh, we're asking sheets to maintain the signage, it's the additional signage that's going to be in place. So if they would be willing to do so, that would be a uh, wonderful gesture for us. And the other thing that I wanted to point out uh, is that uh, the stormwater, uh, there's a significant amount of stormwater uh, detention, which is placed through the uh, tanks here. The tanks are volume control, there's water quality, and rate control. So they're meeting all of our requirements. There is an additional requirement that we have through our MS4 program, Municipal Separate St Storm Floor Program. And that is that they use an impermeable liner through here, and that is just in case there, uh, that there would be a discharge of fuel that the uh, fuel would not be uh, permeated into the ground. So the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, this was identified by an ecologist, certified ecologist, that this is a water course and our stormwater requirement is that the stormwater discharge into a water course or a stream or an identified uh, water area, and this is. So uh, this was identified. It can't be altered in any way uh, without a DEP permit. So I wanted to point those things out. Uh, I know it went through the stormwater very quickly. We did uh, spend a lot of time on it. Uh, the other thing is that I want to reiterate that we have not reviewed the changes, and we will do that quickly. Uh, our experts will review the changes that were provided by Sheets. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else from the town council? Anyone from the 
uh, Marilyn DeSanti, 8725 Casa Grande. Um, I'm here this evening um, on behalf of Jason Moots, uh, who happened to be out of uh, state uh, for work. And I'm here to represent some of the other individuals that live on um, Montclair. Um, one of the statements that uh, uh, Jason wanted me to mention that uh, we were promised by town council in August <clears throat> that, the that the conditional approval of sheets meant the town council could promote stipulations on sheets to protect the residents. During the March Planning Commission meeting, the planning board requested that sheets look into an alternative to the second entrance on Montclair, and also relocating the dumpsters further away from homes. During the April meeting, the planning board asked them if they would look into their recommendations into consideration, wait a minute, during the April meeting, the planning board asked them if they took their recommendations into consideration, and Sheet said they didn't investigate an alternative. Due to this, the planning uh, board voted against the proposal. The residents don't agree with the second entrance on Montclair, and neither does the board of town officials that are professionals and have years of experience in town planning. We have provided photos that demonstrate why the sheets proposal needs denied based on this rationale. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, and I, I believe uh, Mrs. Martin had mentioned in the last uh, planning commission meeting uh, uh, in regards to the ingress and egress, um, there are certain criteria that have to be met um, according to planning code 1328.10. Um, one of them was it would have to be on a corner lot. Obviously, that was met. Um, the second one, there should be no loading or offloading. As you can see from the photographs that we've provided, that uh, that will be the case. Um, it would have to be determined that such access will not substantially alter the character of the residential area. Well, we all know that that uh, is definitely going to affect the residential area. Um, number three, if it is determined that such access will not substantially alter the character of the residential area, um, again, we're talking about a dead end street here that there can be no turnarounds. Um, Looking at some of these pictures also will tell you um, why it shouldn't uh, have access to uh, or shouldn't have a uh, side entrance. Um, one of the things that, you know, kind of stuck with me is, again, um, at the very first meeting, the Planning Commission had asked Sheets to please look into something other than um, this alternative access on Montclair. They also asked them to move the dumpster. And whenever they came to the second meeting, when uh, or the uh, uh, planning commission wanted to hear what they came up with, uh, Mr. Wotus stood up and told them he didn't look into any alternatives. And so they did absolutely nothing. And it wasn't until they were voted down three to three that they decided to do something. And magically, we now have the dumpster moved, which is great because you know what? These people on Montclair don't want to have to deal with the dumpster in their front yard. They don't want to have to smell rubbish in the, in the 90 degree days in the summertime. But yet, they couldn't find a better alternative. But all of a sudden, magically, because, because the Planning Commission voted them down, they magically came up with a, an alternative. But yet, they still refused to do something with regards to that Montclair entrance. Um, we all know that people don't follow stop signs. I have a stop sign in my front yard. People just fly through it all the time. And I hear people t talking about it all the time. But supposedly, we don't have enough police participation in order to police that area. So we all know that that stop sign at that entrance, if they decide to put that Montclair entrance, people are just going to fly through it just like they do every other stop sign. You're kidding yourself if you think that's not going to happen. All that's doing is inviting more people to come in that entrance because we all know that nobody wants to wait because everybody's in a hurry and what you're going to have is everybody coming into the Montclair entrance in order to get to Sheets faster and to get out of there as quickly as they possibly can. And even though you don't think there will be people coming down Montclair, they will because people will look for any alternative to try to find a faster way in and out. Uh, putting a speed bump after the entrance to the uh, exit, uh, or the after the uh, Montclair entrance, uh, or exit, I should say, entrance, exit, whatever you want to call it, is is not doing anything but making it worse for the for the residents. Thank you. Good evening. 
My name is Nancy Rupp, and I live at 231 Montclair Avenue. We, the residents of Montclair Avenue, have been opposed to the sheet's entrance on Montclair because we are concerned with the child safety at the school bus stop. The Planning Commission did not approve Sheets' proposal twice now. In the March plan, uh, Planning Commission meeting, Sheets was told to look for an alternative to the second entrance on Montclair. In the April meeting, Sheets said they did not investigate an alternative for the second entrance when asked by the Planning Commission. Who are these people that think that they can come in to our neighborhood and build without the Planning Commission approval? Why on earth would they even think to come tonight to town council seeking approval of their proposal when the planning commission wouldn't approve their plan? Our team of experts on the planning commission did not approve Sheets' plan, and you as council members should not approve it either. I guarantee you, not one of you would approve a Sheets entrance on your residential street and your residential neighborhood if there was a school bus stop at, at the end of your street. So before you vote, you think about the danger and jeopardy you'll be putting our children that live on Montclair Avenue. What is the purpose of having a zoning commission or planning commission if town council doesn't respect and vote against their recommendations? We do not want the sheets entrance on Montclair. We, the residents and the Planning Commission, do not agree with Sheets's proposal, and therefore it should be denied. Thank you. Craig Doverspike, 170 Montclair Avenue. I'll say this, the one thing is, is since they've, they've turned the pumps off at the Sheets across the street, the, the timing of the lights do work. You know, even in the morning, yeah, the traffic, once it lets up, you're right out. I wouldn't have believed it unless they shut the pumps off because that's a little gas station to me. And now here they're putting in 35 spaces. They don't put them in unless they inspect the fill them and a lot of pumps. And I don't know why. I know that the lot's angled, but why wouldn't you put the building square to 19? Angling it that way kind of promotes the Montclair turn it to anyone coming northbound. Uh, I don't think the street can handle it. I don't think I should be burdened with speed bump. I don't think I should be burdened with the extra traffic that's on my street. Um, you know, none of us have anything against sheets. It's just, you know, I don't think any one of you would agree that you'd want this done if you lived on Montclair Avenue. You know, so that's about it. Thank you. Hi, Frida Martin, Grubbs Road. Um, just a concerned citizen. I, I went through uh, the zoning code, and I we have a planning commission, and we have a zoning code. And they've made improvements since I was at the planning meeting to some extent, but the greatest improvement that is needed is for that Montclair exit entrance and exit to be closed for the safety of these people. Your garbage trucks have to back up that street. Think about that. That's how narrow the street is, and there's no turnaround. They have to back up. Talk about park, parking on both sides of the street. People park on both sides of the street. Montclair, if you've been down there, they do that. This is untenable by both your zoning code, if you read it carefully, it clearly states that safety is the big issue, and your planning commission also agreed that it was not safe the way it is. That's what they're looking at. It's not about, they're wonderful people. They're great. I mean, they have all these experts trying to, to get their way here. But we have citizens who have to live there and have, um, they have first rights. That's what our zoning is for. That is what our planning commission is for, to protect our citizens and the value of their property. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, the uh, zoning uh, committee meeting is, is um, here by adjourned. Three minute recess. Take me. Oh. <laughs>
can't wait till they no. sat, but. He was ready to go home. It's his wife back there. He He's just going. He went to the bathroom. Greg just left. Greg just started his three minute program. Five minutes later. Mm -hmm. He should have started earlier. Three minutes is up. We're going to um, continue to review the draft proposal pertaining to the establishment of the Technology Committee. So we had that, um, I know Bill was um, helping out on Bill's yet another subcommittee, was helping out on the um, Technology Committee that, um, so from my, in, in your packet is a um, email as well as a proposal for the idea of this um, technology committee. So um, that's what all of that is, and, and we've talked about um, this quite a bit. So what I'm proposing um, that we do is like what we did for the EAC, and that is, in fact, we can even take the, um, the EAC proposal. I looked over it and just, change a few things about the establishment, about five people instead of seven, without going to the, um, without them being divided into uh, categories. No, that's not the one. Um, and go ahead and get that, um, get the committee established and then allow the committee um, people who are chosen to go through, just like the EAC did, and prioritize and then submit their projects to council for approval. So we wouldn't have to have all of these um, um, broad mission statements and all these things. That was something the committee would kind of put together. So um, since, I mean, for us to, you know, I mean, that's, what, that's why we're putting the committee together so they could do that work. So what do you think about um, putting together Um, making some changes and uh, just adapting the language from the EAC for the Technology Committee and we can get that sent out to everybody and review it at the next meeting and then see if we can get the committee started, start some interviews and then let them work through these other things. I think, I think that's a reasonable path forward, Madam President. Mm -hmm. just one, one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to give myself up to speed sure. with this. Um, in terms of staff involvement, as I read this, it says that the town may provide administrative assistance or other assistance. I think one, one thing, uh, I'm sorry, not used to having the microphones in front of me. Um, one thing that we, I think would be good would be to ensure that there's staff involvement uh, with the, the committee um, since there's going to be ongoing work on behalf of the staff. Um, and we could, I found it. Okay. And um, the way the EAC has done this is John Brzezowski is our staff member. So he kind of, uh, he comes in and he takes all the notes and then there's a liaison from council. Okay. So, um, and we can uh, work on that to see, you know, how um, how much support would be needed. Maybe we don't need someone at every meeting for this. I don't know because some of the other meetings there isn't some staff from. So we could use them as it was needed, maybe. Okay. So I find I did find it, and so I just replaced um, TAC. For EAC through here, that's the um, definition. And then instead of four members, because we decided five on this instead of seven on the EAC, it would be three initial members appointed for four years, and then two appointed. Who wrote this for you? And, um, I appreciate that. I want a discount. And um, so it's it's really just like this. And we'll turn it out to council. And we just have to decide a day. That's the only thing on here. And we would check the count. Um, and, 
And um, Mr. Town Manager, if, if it would be possible, we could check the town calendar and find a good time when nothing else was going on and um, put a couple of those dates in there and, and uh, so we could pick which one we thought would work out. Okay. All meetings are always at 730. But if that's okay with everyone, then we can get this maybe put together sure. and then um, for our agenda review. And then if we like it, maybe vote on it, start interviewing, and move from there. Any nods from the uh, okay. east side? Okay. All right. Um, moving on, a recommendation that a resolution be adopted, amending resolution number 13 of 2017 authorizing the temporary investment of town funds to be made to make transfers of said deposited funds from and to accounts only in the name of and owned by the town of McCandless by town manager Robert T. Graham. Um, this would be, um, this is just part of the duties of the town manager and um, they uh, just something we haven't had to do in a lot of years, but this is just part of housekeeping to get our new guy in place. Any questions about that? It's pretty standard. Okay. Recommendation that a resolution be adopted naming Robert T. Graham as the Town of McCandless Delegate and Judith M. Wagner as the alternate delegate to the North Allegheny North Tax Collection Committee. So again, housekeeping measures. Um, a tiny bit of history. It sounded like Toby. In 1965, Jerry. Allegheny County was divided into <laughs> <laughs> four tax collection districts. You would think it would be north, south, east, and west. Not true. Um, central, north, southeast, southwest. And each of these districts are gov governed by a tax collection <clears throat> committee. And each municipality has a, see if I'm getting this right, each municipality has a representative and then they decide when the contract's up, do you go with Keystone, do you go with Jordan, kind of what you do with that. So we need to have a representative our, um, and, and an alternate and so Toby was ours and so we're gonna have Bob. So pretty good with that? Wonderful. And that's a good thing. Um, any other questions about that? More housekeeping, really. But it's just these are things we have to just vote on by resolution. Notification that a res resolution should be scheduled for adoption declaring the town's intent to destroy non-permanent obsolete public records in accordance with the schedules and procedures for the uh, disposition of uh, records as set forth in the Pennsylvania Municipal Records Manual approved on July 16, 1993 as amended. This is just the law that gives us permission to get rid of a bunch of junk that we don't have to have all really important stuff we pay a lot of money for to get recorded and be kept for like ever. That's the explanation for that. Um, conferences, the only thing on here is mark your calendar for the emergency services picnic July 13th and the golf outing is August 10th. I know it's early but that's um, all I had for that. I think that's it. Um, adjourn the Finance and Personnel Committee. Recreation. But oh, one comment. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, the public. Any public comment? Thank you. Sorry. I'd like to call to order Recreation and Culture Committee meeting. Number two is recommendation that the policy and procedures for the McCandless North Allegheny. Heritage Center fundraising and promotional activity prepared by the Fundraising and Promotional Development Committee be adopted by resolution of Town Council at the April 22, 2019 regular business meeting. You have a, um, in your packet, there are the stipulations. It's on the last page of our packet. Committees work very hard on this. This is like their third or yes, fourth draft. Yes. This looks stellar. And they, they've worked very hard to try to do what council has asked them to do. It, it looks like they have. They even had some help with a consultant, and it, it looks, I think it looks really good. I, I will pass that along to them because they did work very, very hard. Yes, they have. 
Any questions from council? Okay. Number three. Oh, oh excuse I'm me. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see. Madam you. Chair, just one comment. I just want to point out, and I appreciate that the language uh, for activities there has been made sufficiently broad that it will allow any type of uh, organization to go in there as long as it is uh, in the uh, in the interests of, um, of, of creating greater awareness of the Heritage Center as long as that function respects the artifacts and the displayed items and so that really opens it up to the whole community for use. And follow, and and follow the rules uh, of the Heritage right. Center. Right, and, and I just think that was really important and I'm glad that that was, that was put in there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll get you at the end. Number three, update on the sponsorship program for the proposed fitness court being partially funded by the National Fitness Campaign, which requires fundraising for the remainder of its cost. And they are working on looking for other sponsorships. Any comment by council? Um, so my understanding of this um, is that uh, we've contacted primarily one, I think, I think one uh, business which um, has not gotten back with us uh, yet. So um, I'd like for us to, to move forward with contacting other sponsors. I don't think we should contact one sponsor and wait. Well, okay, that, that three, is being worked three. on. Three. Well, that, well, that's what I want an update. Yeah, that, for, is, for that is being worked on right now, but we didn't want to name it. Yet. Quickly, <coughs> in the interest of keeping that pursuing that, uh, there are uh, the larger sponsors are being sought first, and there are some, there's some bureaucracy to go through, but uh, three significant, potentially significant sponsors have been contacted, and it's just a matter of uh, them responding. This, the, first, the first one has uh, taken it uh, to the, their corporate level. The other two are still, we're still trying to find the exact person to talk to. As soon as we have that person, we We'd like to show them the, what, we, uh, what we have to offer. Um, so we, we have a limit on the time for finding sponsors. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we need to contact like, a lot of people so we don't get caught at that deadline. There's a uh, campaign that uh, John Bajarski is putting together to do that for the smaller, smaller sponsors. We, we just aren't naming any right now, right? We're just right. kind of. But, it, but as far as a broad campaign, he's worked on information that we can promulgate. I know he's really busy and, and has a ton of things going. It, he's okay with having time for that? Do we need to um, help him or it, he's okay with that? Uh, I, he's, he's got a lot of hats. He has, and he's, yeah. he's, he's doing a pretty good job of juggling. Okay. And uh, Dion Alfonsi is helping, and I'm helping. Okay. Okay, all right, so you've got the help you need to. I think for, for I now. I just didn't yeah. want you to get behind the eight ball, and if you need help, then, you know, ask him. Thank you for that. Okay. Any other comments from council? You don't have your hand up. I can't see. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Any comments from the audience on any? It's, um, what am I looking at here? It was so far back, I didn't get a chance to read it all. The Financial Development Promotional Committee. They're not a foundation, they're just a committee. So um, they have a treasurer, or someone that takes care of all the funds that come in. How does that, it doesn't get put into our um, budget or anything, does it? It's separate from our budget? Oh, 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 um, I'm, oh, okay, Toby, do you, do you Toby, want to address that, that please? To me? Yeah. It's very, it's very clear that it's a governmental organization. It's part of our government. And council has made it very clear that the uh, committee will, is their, their goal is to, the council's goal for the committee is to help set up programs, have events that are going to help subsidize it, but it still remains part of our government. They're an advisory committee. Council is the board of directors.